Now, surely there is nothing in the Christian life that we we see as being so needful and yet at the same time as so difficult than the matter of prayer and of seeking the face of God. As we know from the occasion in Luke chapter 11 when one of the disciples came to the Lord Jesus Christ and he asked a question or rather he sought for instruction and he said, teach us to pray. Lord, teach us to pray that there was a reminder that it is always the very desire and the very cry of the, the genuine and the true child of God to know something more of prayer and to know how we should pray in a biblical fashion. Evidently, there are many areas that you can explore when you come to such a subject such as this, and I'm very much aware of this. And it's not my intention this morning, and I want you to understand this, to deal with every single issue when it comes to how we should pray and why we should pray. For example, we could think about such things as why any Christian can pray. Ever thought about that? Why can we pray? And maybe something of that was dealt with last Sunday evening. If you didn't get a chance to listen, you can do online in Romans 5 in verse 2, where the Apostle Paul reminds the people of God that one of those tremendous fruits and effects of being justified by faith in Christ is that poor, needy sinners who are alienated because of their sin, can have access to Almighty God. And remember, believer, the reason why we can pray is not because we are better than other people, but rather because in Christ we have access to the throne of God and all of our weakness and all of our trepidation and our fears and our tremblings. The people of God can and must pray. That is why we can pray the very worth and the merit of Christ. We could think about the spirit of prayer, how we should pray when it comes to our spirit of prayer. For surely those who are purchased by the blood of Christ and in whom the spirit of God dwells cannot pray in some cold and indifferent fashion. There is a degree of fervor and there is a passion and there is an earnestness that pervades our very being as we seek the face of God. So these are all important things, and there are many things that we could think about when it comes to prayer. But what I'm going to do this morning with the words of David's prayer is to provide for you a template for prayer. Now this is not the first time such a thing has been done. Remember the Lord's Prayer, as it's commonly called, is not necessarily a prayer that we should recite word for word, although there is nothing wrong in doing that. We do that for the children. We should do it at times ourselves if done earnestly, but the intention of Christ when he gave that prayer was to provide certain guidelines for prayer. So whenever he speaks of our Father being in heaven, he's reminding the the child of God that when you come to pray, that you remind yourself of the one to whom you come, and the one who is in heaven. And if you trace that type of thinking throughout the entirety of the Lord's Prayer, you will start to see that far from being something that we just repeat word for word in a mindless fashion, that rather God gives to us uh, pointers and guidelines and ways in which we can formulate our prayer and how we should structure it. Because believe it or not, the Christian should be one who is praying intelligently. Uh, That is, we pray with biblical spiritual intelligence. We don't just uh, utter vain words and repetitive words. Uh, There are things we ought to pray for. There is a certain understanding we are to have of God as we come to the throne of grace. So is there a template in David's life? Yes, there is. Here in 2 Samuel chapter 7 and from verse 18 and onwards. Remember from last week, David had this burning desire to build a temple, didn't he? Now, for those who weren't here, I'm not going to uh, repeat the message, but you should be familiar to some degree with this chapter. And there David wanted so much at the beginning to build the temple as a, a token of glorifying God. He could think of nothing better to do. And in many respects, of course, it was the most noble desire and intention. Now, Nathan, being the prophet of the Lord, now initially he backs David up. But being a prophet of God, he's the mouthpiece of God. And the Lord comes to Nathan, and of course, new information is provided. And while the intention was noble, and it was godly, it was not to be David's action. 
It was to be saved for his son, Solomon. Now, many people, when they have a strong desire to do something, and, and even a spiritual ambition, when they're told, no, that's not for you, many people might react in the wrong way. The expression that sometimes we use is the nose being put out of joint. And David did not have his nose put out of joint in this instance. He was not someone who now sort of threw his hands up in the air and said, well, you know, I'm disillusioned with the whole thing. This is what I thought I should be doing. People are telling me otherwise. Rather, God was saying this, of course. Well, if that's the way things are, I'm just going to quit. That's not David's mind. That's not how he thinks. In fact, he does the very opposite. And what I want to point out to you by way of introduction this morning is that the word of God that is spoken to David becomes the precursor and the stimulant for even more fervent praying. David was a man who prayed with great heart and passion and was zeal, as we know. But now having received a word from God, a most definite word to his soul, through the prophet Nathan, we find that here is now a man who prays in a more humble and in a more biblical fashion. Bible commentator Arthur Pink pointedly remarked in his commentary on the life of David, he said, when the Christian complains that his or her heart is cold and the spirit of prayer is quite inactive within him, nine times out of ten, it is because the word of God has been neglected. And he's right, isn't he? And sometimes we, we do that, Christian. We, we complain and we say, you know, why am I so cold? And why am I so indifferent at the throne of grace? Why do I struggle in prayer? And if we really examine ourselves, we come to understand how often the book is closed to our hearts. You see, there is a link which God has established with the word and prayer, and it's never to be divided, and it's never to be separated. And a people who become a people of the book will be a people of prayer. And look, if we become a church of the book, we become a church that prays. And it's something we ought to be doing more. Meeting for prayer, individually seeking God in prayer. If the word of God has a hold of our heart as it should, then the throne of grace will demand our attention. And that's something with David here. He hears the word. He has a, a, a promise concerning his son, concerning a, the whole nation and generations to come. And he, he takes up the promise of God and he runs with it. And he goes before the throne of grace. And so we now come to this most tremendous template for prayer. And I hope that it's helpful for you. I trust that's the case. I prepare this message. I pray to this end. The Lord will um, use it to uh, help each of us in our prayer life uh, in the coming days. First of all, let's look at the presentation of ourselves to God in prayer. The presentation of ourselves to God in prayer. Look at the posture of David in verse 18. Then went King David in and sat before the Lord. Let's just pause there, believer. He goes into the tabernacle. Of course, the temple is not built, but the tabernacle which he built is still there. He's in the place where the Ark of the Covenant is. He's in the place where he, he had these initial desires where he thought, you know, this is not enough just to be in a tent and, and the Ark dwelling behind curtains. We need better things for God. And, and his whole thinking is turned the other way around. And so he goes back into the place where God says, I'll meet with you. There where there is a connection to the very thing he desires. And the scripture says that he sat before the Lord. Is there significance in that wording? I think there is. Now we often think of kneeling. I don't know how each of you pray in your posture when you're on your own. Um, some kneel uh, and they favor that. Some will even stand. Some will walk around. I remember reading a biography of um, an individual, a man of God, and the only way he found that he could pray and, and to focus in prayer was to walk up and down and verbally and loudly and audibly uh, speak his prayer because of all the distractions that he found around him. I think he felt if anyone was listening or watching, they wouldn't quite know exactly what he was doing. But for him, that was the way in which he found his quiet times 
were beneficial and fruitful to him. I would say most of us maybe sit, some kneel, some find another posture. That there's a certain element of importance, but I'm not going to put too much weight upon those words. I suppose we could think of Moses when he faced the Amalekites and when, when Joshua was battling in the field and then Moses began to tire and to, to weary and there was Aaron and there was her and they gave him a rock and they sat him down and they stayed up his hands and he sat there and he communed with God in a posture of prayer. But what I want to say is not so much the physical posture, but I think what David does here. It sort of presents his soul to us as well. When he sits before the Lord, the Lord is saying that he's coming before God and he's ready to wait upon the Lord. Because when you sit, there is a determination to wait. Sometimes if we're standing and we're sort of, you know, waiting for something to arrive, uh, if you're maybe on a platform waiting for a train or waiting for a bus and you, you, you think it's imminent, so you're standing, you're ready, you're ready to go. But if you realize it's going to be another 10, 15 minutes, you find a chair, you sit yourself down because you know you have to wait. And so David, his posture is significant and when he sits, it is a spiritual reminder that his soul is seated before God. He's going to wait upon his Lord. And so the presentation of ourselves to God in prayer, my friend, must always be like this. Never rush your presence before the throne of God. Never rush ourselves before God. I know that's hard. And I know that when you have all of your life and your work and your commitments and maybe family, if you have them, and, and children, if they're in the home and you know the things you have to do, the things that need to be done, but don't allow yourself to be rushed. Like David, we sit before him and we present ourselves before the God who demands our utmost attention. And then there's reflection, not just posture, but reflection in our presentation. Look at verse 18. And David says, now he begins to pray. Look at his manner of prayer as he reflects. He says, who am I? Who am I, O Lord God, and what is my house that thou hast brought me hither to? You know, the one who truly knows the Lord as his saviour and king is one that reflects upon their own insignificance before the presence of God. Now, please do not misunderstand me. I'm not saying that we sort of debase ourselves. I'm not saying that you think, you know, there's no value to your life or to your existence. And that, you know, you should sort of spend your life bent in two without looking at someone in the eye. You know, that's not what David is doing here. Rather, as he comes to God in prayer, he, he's, he's, he feels how small he is and, and, and what God has done for him and how God has brought him from a former place to the present place. And he says, Lord, what am I? Who am I? And what is my house? And he thinks about where he comes from and the meanness of his father's home, of Jesse's home, and of his brethren, because they were nothing compared to others. And how dare we come before God in prayer and forget what God has brought us from? We've been delivered from so much. Saved from so much. Isaiah 51 verse 1 says, Hearken to me, ye that follow after righteousness, ye that seek the Lord. Look unto the rock whence ye are hewn, and to the hole of the pit whence ye are digged. Remember where you've come from. In that spiritual sense, delivered from a multitude of sin. From our unbelief and our ungodliness. And David maybe thinks about what he presently has, and we'll see this in a moment. David was a king. He commands the attention of all the citizens. He has the respect of all the people. He could click his fingers and servants would come running. But that doesn't fill him with pride. In fact, we find that such a man as this, so humble and so contrite in his heart, that thou hast brought me hitherto. And then verse 19 and 20, in his presentation of himself look at his gratitude and his thankfulness it goes without saying that thankfulness and gratitude must fill much of our cup of prayer 
We, we all find it a most obnoxious thing when people are not thankful in life. You know, when someone just grabs something. You know, you've given them something and they just grab it and they don't say thank you. When your children, you have to sort of remind them to come back, you know, force them, say thank you for, for what you have. And they sort of mouths are saying it against their own will. Uh, but as long as they say it, you're happy. So we all find at some point uh, that we're offended by that type of thing. Well, then why would we come to God and not express our gratitude and the thankfulness of what he has done for us? No, David does that very thing. But before we look at David's words, let's look at some other scriptures. Jonah 2 and verse 9. When he was there in the belly of the great fish, he said, I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. Paul writes to the believers at Philippi in chapter 4 and verse 6, and he speaks about the need not to be anxious. He says, be careful for nothing, don't be worrying for things of no consequence, but in everything by prayer and by supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Now here's a question for you to think about this morning. What form does David's thanksgiving take? Now, what I mean by that is, is David just coming before the Lord and saying, Lord, thank you, and then rushing on with a presence of uh, a list of all the things I want. But as long as he's sort of checked off his conscience and says, thank you, then I can just ask for all these things. No, that's not what David is doing here. Rather, David measures what God has already done. And David doesn't stop there. He then goes on to compare what God promises to do. So when David brings together the two things, what God has done and what God will continue to do and promises to do, the man of God is utterly overwhelmed in his life. And there's a sense in which he is speechless. And so if you look there at verse 19, he says, and this was yet a small thing in thy sight. Oh, Lord God, what was a small thing in his sight? Defeating Goliath. He says, that's a small thing. Delivering me from the hands of Saul, that's a small thing. Rescuing me from my depression spiritually and mentally and emotionally, that's a small thing. You see what David is doing here in verse 19. He reflects on all the past mercies of God and he says, in comparison with what God says he's going to do, it's a small thing. And then he goes on to speak about something else. To, I, I suppose we need to focus his appreciation and his gratitude. He says there in verse 19 towards the end, And is this the manner of man, O Lord God? Now what does David mean when he says, is this the manner of man? Well, he just simply means this. Is this how people act in life? You know, a way of, of helping him to think about all that God is doing for him. He asks a question, is this what people do? Well, the answer, of course, is, is no. It's not what they do. You might find people that will be very kind and, and generous. And I understand that. And God's people are in that respect in many cases. But he's not really dealing with that. He said, where's, where's the individual? Where's this, the case of one who has the, the ability to, to command all wealth? To command all power. And to command all authority. And, and to have all things. And then to stoop. And to go so low. And then not just to stoop to such a level that to promise all things to them. Is that the manner of man? No, it's not. And then we, we think of something even greater because this is in reference to many temporal things in David's life. But what is even more astonishing, Christian, this morning is that what David is privileged to experience is dwarfed by what you and what I experience in the gospel. Can I just remind you of the words of Romans 8.32, he that spared not his own son. And you stop there, don't you? And you say, what is the gospel? What has Christ done for me? What is the essence of that very message? God did not spare his son. He gives the son of God for me. He gives him to beatings and bruisings. 
He gives him to lashings and ridicules. He gives him to the curse of Calvary and to endure hell in his soul for my sin. He does not spare his son when every man and every woman would spare their child and would never give them over for the life and substitution of some wretched, ungodly individual. God does not spare his son. He delivered him up for us all. And then Paul says, how shall he not with him? Also, freely give us all things. Does that not breed in your heart gratitude? I can't say to you that you need to be thankful as a Christian and not tell you why. And that's why I'm touching on this. That we are like David, and as we present ourselves to him in prayer, that before we do any, anything else, this is how we approach God, with this reflection and with this gratitude uh, as we come to God. And then notice, secondly, the praising of God in prayer, and that will be verses 21 to 24. The praising of God in prayer, what do we praise? Well, let's just follow David's template, shall we? Because, again, there are many things you could praise God for, but we're using David's template. First of all, God's good pleasure. The pleasure of God. Look at verse 21. And he says, For thy word's sake uh, and according to thine own heart hast thou done all these great things to make thy servant know them. So David does something very important here, Christian, that we should keep close to us at the throne of grace. That is, David knows the reason behind all the acts and all the deliverances and all the benefits that he receives at God's hand. And what is the chief reason? It is the good, sovereign pleasure of God. And let me say, if that, if that is not part of the equation of prayer, we will be finding ourselves fumbling around in the dark, asking the question, well, why? You see, everything comes to this. As David so rightly says, Lord, it is according to your heart. According to your heart that you do this. And if we think of ourselves, and you think of all our own motives, and our own intentions, and so often we attribute them, what do you attribute them to? You attribute them to your heart, don't you? I know the mind works certain things out, but those acts of compassion and kindness and all those gestures, they, they tend to emanate and flow from our very heart, the seat of our soul. It is the issue of life. It is the fountain from which all things flow. So much so when it comes, and more so to the things of God. It is the, therefore the securing of his own pleasure that is to be praised. We praise God for his good pleasure. And you know that will help you mightily in prayer. Because when you're praying and you're struggling, and when you face a situation where you don't know why it is happening, that you can say, Lord, it is according to your heart, not my heart but your heart. And you might not know all the reasons behind what God is allowing you to go through and what you're enduring, but what you can do, just like David, when his circumstances changed, when his desires changed, when he felt that his initial desire was in line with God's will, and he was told, no, it's not. And now he says, Lord, I know something more of the pleasure and the good pleasure of God. It is according to your heart. Mature praying will be praying that prays in a submissive will to the heart of God. That's what it will be. And so we will praise him, won't we, for his good pleasure. And then we will pra praise God for his greatness. Praise him. People of God for his greatness. Then verse 22. And um, for me, this is a, a most tremendous verse which I've been struck by this week. Verse 22. Wherefore thou art great. Wherefore thou art great, he says. So David proceeds to rise in his prayer life. And, and, and there's something here of a, a progression and a going on with God as he comes now before the face of God in prayer. And, and he's moved away from himself, hasn't he? And he's, he's taken something of the dealings of God in his own life and 
He's evaluated all the condescending grace of God and his godly mind of David, his heart which has been established by grace, which is indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. He now comes to conclude in this verse that is before us now, verse 22, he says, Wherefore thou art great. You see, he praises God for his greatness. How shameful, the professing Christian, that barely prays like this. Now, I'm not speaking about maybe a tendency that some people have just to sort of utter a few words and say, well, God is great and God is good. You know, anyone can do that. I don't buy into that. I, I, I will certainly remind you that it is not the case that we don't just come with repetitious words or with a type of stammering speech without any thought to what we're saying here. We can't just say God is great and not know why he's great. David doesn't do that. He says, wherefore? He knows the reasons why God is great. And therefore, he glorifies God accordingly. You know, if all that we do, and I I sometimes um, see it, not saying here, but maybe you see it sometimes on TVs and you see these channels and people just repeatedly say God is great, God is great. You know, we're no different from the poor Muslim. Poor Muslim. Be part of their very ritual every day is to say very similar things. But if you asked an individual Muslim, well, why their God or why they view Allah or God to be great, they have real no personal reason, no personal acquaintance with a saving God in a savior revealed to them as to why God is great. It is said merely out of repetition and fear than in anything. No, no, the Christian is so different. And when we come to God and we praise him for his greatness, it's because we are occupied and we are filled with the knowledge as to why God is great, because we have that wherefore in verse 22. And let me say, the wherefore is equally as important as the thou art great. Because David traces all that God has done for him and all that God promises to do for him. And my friend, we trace all those precious promises in Christ and the gospel of saving grace. And we say, Lord, that is why you are great. We survey the the creation of God, and we say, how great thou art. And we survey the providences of God, and we say, Lord, how great thou art. But higher still and further still, we survey Calvary, we survey Gethsemane, we survey the risen Christ, we survey the clouds in which Christ shall come again. And we say, in a personal knowledge of Christ, if we're saved, thou art great. That's why he is great. And then we praise him for his graciousness. Look at verse 23 and verse 24, and I'll just go through this very briefly with you. He looks back over the the dealings of God with Israel as a nation, and he says, what one nation in the earth is like thy people? He thinks about the remarkable example of Israel as a nation that God goes to redeem for a people to himself, to make him a name, to do great things. And remember, they were not chosen because of size or strength or prestige or power. They were the very opposite. They were chosen because God set his love upon them, unconditional love. And likewise, when it comes to the people of God at large, the very Church of Christ itself, that language is employed, that God goes to make a people for himself. That's what the Lord did to you. If you're saved this morning, I know sometimes in our human angle, we look at it, you know, we came to Christ and we believe in him. And in that sense, we, we have to believe on Christ. But God seeks out the sinner. God goes to make a people for himself. God redeems us to himself. But he becomes our God, that we might be his people, and therefore we praise him for his graciousness. And so we have uh, that presentation of ourselves before God, the praises of God in prayer. Then very finally, and as I finish this morning, the pleadings of the promises of God in prayer. One man said, turn God's promises into prayers. And might we do well to do that on a daily basis. And I finish here with these final few thoughts. 
verses 25 to 29. Let me leave you with an incentive to pray that rests in the promise of God. An incentive to pray rests within the promises of God. Verse 27, I point your attention to. Verse 27, and more so towards uh, the end. And he says, I will build thee in house. Therefore hath thy servant found in his heart to pray this prayer unto thee. Isn't that wonderful language? Now, again, think about what David's doing here. He's, he's going back to the promise of God about a future temple. And, and of course, now the promise is something yet to be. David's not going to see it. It's going to be for Solomon. And David initially was not in that right direction. But now when he comes to the right place by the very grace of God, he knows now what the mind of God is. And with gusto and with focus and determination, he prays. I know what God wants me to do and what God will do. I'm going to pray. Now, how do you fit that into the Christian life? Is it the case, and I'm going to be very careful with what I say here because I don't want to discourage anyone here. Is it the case that just any promise that you read of in the Bible is something you can say, that's my promise, I'm going to pray it. I'm going to say, and I can say, explain another day, that's not the case. That's not the case. You know, there might be certain verses and statements in Scripture that we might just rip from its context. And, and it has no bearing upon personal application. It's something else altogether different. And lots of Christians make the mistake and become disillusioned. They say, well, God gave me that promise. And it hasn't been revealed as a collective promise to the people of God or the Church of Christ. And therefore, it can be discouraging because people pray and they don't see certain answers in that respect, that's not to say there won't be those times God gives to you a word. I've had them myself, and you've had them. And we're careful as we seek God in respect. So what promises can we pray through? Well, let's remind ourselves what God has revealed in his word, as being his mind for you and for me to pray. It is the mind of God that we pray for the very furtherance of the kingdom. I've said that on previous occasions, and I'll say it again. We know it's the mind of God to let the kingdom of God come. Therefore, pray that God will do that very thing. Therefore, it's the mind of God to save precious souls, to edify the saints of God, to grow in godliness. It is the pleasure of God to exalt his Son, can I say, when was the last time we prayed like that? Lord, exalt your son. The base the nations. And exalt the son of God. And bow the knees of multitudes before the Lord. I, I will say this. If that's the very prayer that God is pleased to answer. All the other things that we're praying for. That we're not too quite sure about. They'll, they'll fall into place. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. That's the formula for prayer. So instead of just maybe randomly um, extracting a few words from, from Scripture and saying, well, maybe I can pray that for myself, and then giving up a few days later because you don't really know if it's the right thing to pray for, I say to you, get a hold of the promises of God's Word that He's revealed to His church and get them into your heart and pray them through. And don't let go May the Lord give us as a church that spirit of prayer because we need it. We need it. With all the things that we hope to do and plan to do, all the outreaches that we do, this is what we should pray for. So again, it's not excusing to pray for health and to be restored and healing and all those things which God at times is pleased to answer. But prioritizing those promises and praying them through. And then doing something which is almost seems contrary to what I've been saying this morning. Appealing to God. Reasoning with God. You know, whenever I, I pray myself, and I hear others pray, not in a critical sense, but just because you hear people pray, it's sometimes something we don't do, and we should do. And it's reasoning and plead and, and agonize with God at the throne of grace.
Look at verse 25 with me of that same chapter. It's amazing when you take in all that you've considered. And so look at David now in verse 25. He says, And now, O Lord God, the word that thou hast spoken concerning thy servant and concerning his house. Let's just stop as I finish here this morning. David has heard a promise that is not going to be received for quite a while. David knows it's not going to be his privilege to see it through. So let's get that in our minds. And yet still he's moved to reason and agonize with God in verse 25. And he says, now, Lord God, the word that thou hast spoken concerning thy servant and concerning his house, establish it forever and do as thou hast said. The Lord says, I'm going to do it. (laughs) He's still praying, do it. The Lord says, I'm going to do it. This is what prayer is. It's, it's going over the lines. You know whenever you're teaching a child to write, you're trying to these days, it doesn't always work, does it? And you, maybe sometimes, I remember when I was in school, you'd have uh, those dashes, you'd have you know, letters, and you'd have to trace over them with a pencil. Make sure you, you kept your, your writing within the, sort of the pattern and so forth. Um, maybe you didn't have that, maybe you could write quite normally, unlike me when I was a, a child, but um, that's the very same thing. God has traced out those promises you go over them, and you go over them, and, and you don't just trace over them, you keep going over them, and plead them through. I always remember one friend I had at school, and I used to always think, why is he writing so hard? Um, he, he would be writing, and he'd be pressing down, it would be like Braille, and he'd turn it around, and sort of embossed on the other side. I don't know why he did that, but it just comes to my mind that that's the type of prayer we should be, that we're pleading what God has said. And he says, I'll do it. I'll build my church. I'll establish my people. I'll make them glorious. I'll be their God. They'll be my people. And we come to God and we say, Lord, you've said it. Do it. And Lord, with all reverence, do it now. Have mercy upon us now. So you see, the template of prayer is maybe far different from what we first imagined. But how... Vital it really is. May the Lord give us such a spirit of prayer in these days. May God bless his words to our hearts. Amen.